Hi everybody and welcome to my tour on the architecture of Westminster. I'm Chris and I'm an architect and I'm going to show you around the area. Now I wanted to do the introduction where we're standing in Trafalgar Square which is the most iconic part of Westminster with its famous column and classical architecture surrounding it and we will come back and spend some time looking at the different aspects of Trafalgar Square but before we do that we're going to start the tour just a little further south at Embankment. OK, we're standing in Embankment Gardens, a pretty area just alongside the River Thames. But what's most interesting about this area that most people won't realise is what we're actually standing on. There's in fact a massive sewer carrying all the waste from London out towards the east to a big sewage works. What happened is, in the 19th century, thousands of people were dying of cholera and they were drinking contaminated drinking water from the, directly from the River Thames, which was contaminated by human excrement, horse excrement, and so on. And that, combined with the fact that in 1858, there was an event known as the Great Stink, where things got so smelly that they actually had to close the Houses of Parliament, led to the idea that something needed to be done about this, which led to the design of the sewer by Joseph Bazalgette. In order to design the sewer, they actually took some of the land from the River Thames by making the River Thames narrower. They embanked the Thames, hence the name The Embankment. And in actual fact, the Thames used to be 150 metres wider and it went all the way over in that direction, over to the little stone structure that we can see in the distance and we're going to go now and take a look at that. We're standing here in front of the Watergate and this actually marks the line of where the Thames used to come up to. Behind the Watergate would have been a great big mansion known as York House, designed and constructed for the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers, and this was his Watergate, his entrance from his house down into the River Thames. The actual Watergate itself is one of the first pieces of neoclassical architecture we have here in London, designed during the reign of Charles I in the early 17th century by the architect Inigo Jones, who was a really important early architect here in London. Inigo Jones would have been over to the continent, to Italy and France, to study classical architecture, Roman architecture, before bringing it back to the country. And you can see with this design here, he's got a semicircular pediment on top of the rest of the structure where there are four Doric pilaster columns. There's rustication, bands of rusticated stonework, and you can also make out within the structure the coat of arms to the Villiers family, and either side of that, shells, which denote that the fact that the structure would have been constructed alongside the River Thames. We're back in Trafalgar Square. This whole area was laid out during the reign of George IV, who had also been the Prince Regent. And it was his architect, John Nash, who set about beautifying the capital through projects such as Regent's Park, Regent Street, and Trafalgar Square. Trafalgar Square is named after the Battle of Trafalgar, which took place in 1805 off the south coast of Spain during the Napoleonic Wars. During that battle, Lord Nelson defeated a combined fleet of Spanish and French ships. Unfortunately, Nelson himself was mortally wounded and his body was brought back to the country in a barrel of rum or brandy. And so the story goes is the sailors were actually taking little bits of the, the rum on the way back. And we call that process tupping the Admiralty. In the centre of the square, we have Nelson's column which essentially is a large Corinthian column. It's 170 feet tall with a statue of Nelson on top of it, looking south towards the Admiralty. At the bottom of the column are four lions, and these were created by the sculptor Edwin Landseer. And so the story goes that Landseer was using lions from London Zoo to model his statues on. 
But the problem was the lion started to decompose. So Lanzi had to switch to dogs. So it's considered that the way these lions are sitting is more of the position of a dog than a lion. Okay. Around the square, as well as there being the smallest police box in the country, there are also four plinths. Two of the plinths have war generals on them, Napier and Havelock. The third plinth has a statue of George IV, or the Prince Regent, and the fourth plinth is empty. It was going to have the statue of William IV, but the money wasn't there, available to build it, so it's always remained empty. And today, there are pieces of artwork constructed every few years that sit on top of the plinth. The most imposing building in Trafalgar Square is the National Gallery. It was actually designed on the site of the King's Mews, where he kept his horses before they were moved to Buckingham Palace. It's actually a piece of neoclassical architecture, and later on we'll be able to contrast this neoclassical architecture, such as the architecture of Canada House and Australia House and the National Gallery, with the Gothic architecture of Parliament Square. But if I just walk us round over here, what we can see behind me is the extension to the National Gallery, which is interesting from an architectural perspective. In the 1980s, there was a competition to design the extension to the National Gallery, and the winning scheme was a real high-tech, modern building. And that was what was going to be constructed here until Prince Charles intervened. He called that building, or that design, a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much-loved an elegant friend, the much loved and elegant friend being the National Gallery. So what got built in its place was what we see behind us, the architecture of Robert Venturi, which is a piece of postmodern architecture. Venturi is playing around, so it starts off as being a classical building with its columns, and then as the architecture goes round the corner, the detail starts to fade out and the building itself becomes more modern, hence calling it postmodern architecture. So you may have been wondering which was the oldest building here in Trafalgar Square. Well in actual fact it's the building behind me, St Martin's in the Fields. And it was actually called that because literally when it was first constructed it was in the middle of fields before Trafalgar Square was planned out. The version that we have behind me dates back to the early 18th century and was designed by the architect James Gibbs, who was a contemporary of our architect Christopher Wren. And you can see it behind me with its neoclassical layout, its pediment on top of Corinthian columns with its large spire behind it sort of set back from the pediment. And they say that this church has been influential for lots of other neoclassical churches and many of them in the United States. Behind me is Admiralty Arch. It was actually constructed as a piece of urban planning to connect Trafalgar Square via the Mall down to Buckingham Palace. And the Mall, you might notice, is actually finished in a reddish colour to imitate the idea of a carpet running down to Buckingham Palace. The Admiralty Arch was actually constructed after the reign of Queen Victoria, partly to commemorate her life. It's actually a piece of neoclassical architecture designed by Aston Webb. An interesting fact about the structure is that on the inside face of one of the arches is a model of Napoleon's nose. The idea being that if you pass through the arch on horseback, Napoleon's nose would be at the right height for you to rub it, rubbing in the fact that Britain became the hegemonic power following on from the Battle of Waterloo uh, and the defeat of Napoleon. I will leave you to explore the structure and find out where Napoleon's nose is. This is just a quick stop again on the Mall. You can see it leading down to Buckingham Palace which was also designed by the architect John Nash and I'm going to talk about Buckingham Palace in more detail in a future walking tour coming up soon. Just for now though I wanted to say that the Mall holds a special place in my heart because if you run the London Marathon which I have done you finish on the on the Mall and you kind of finish running the marathon almost like you're ending up dying and you say to yourself I'm never going to run the marathon again which is a bit ridiculous because I've actually run it four times. Okay. 
You may be wondering what this curious looking structure is just here, just alongside the mound. Well, it's actually the Admiralty Citadel. It was constructed during the Second World War. The idea being, if Hitler had been successful and the Germans had made it over here, Winston Churchill and his team were gonna go into the Citadel to fight their last stand. It's actually got a six meter thick concrete roof on it. Winston Churchill hated the structure. He said it was a vast monstrosity which weighed heavily on the horse guard parade just over there where we're going to walk over and see. We've come into horse guards parade. This is where they celebrate the trooping of the colour at the Queen's birthday or official birthday in June. It goes back to the fact that in battle different regiments had different colours. Originally this area was part of St James leper colony but it was bought up by Henry VIII and he developed this particular ground that we're standing on into a tilt yard for jousting because the area stood in front of his palace, Whitehall Palace, which has now been replaced by the buildings behind us, the Horse Guard Parade Building and the Ministry of Defence. And in actual fact, underneath the Ministry of Defence, you can find Henry VIII's wine cellar. Behind me is a really important building from an architectural perspective. It's the Banqueting House. It was designed by Inigo Jones, the architect that designed the Watergate in our, our first stop on the tour. Um, and actually, it's an original piece of Renaissance classical architecture that Jones brought back to the country. Um, and you can see it's double layer there with Ionic columns and Corinthian columns on top. So it's got all the classical features there. And it was particularly influential on the architecture of Christopher Wren and other classical architects that would follow after that. It's also where, in 1649, Charles I had his head chopped off at the end of the Civil War. We've made it to our final stop on the tour, Parliament Square, which unlike Trafalgar Square, which is surrounded by neoclassical architecture, Parliament Square is surrounded by Gothic architecture, either in its original Gothic form or its Gothic revival form. And we'll explore that in a moment or two. Before we do that, I'm just gonna talk a bit about the square, which represents the four arms of the state. On the one hand, behind me, we have the legislative arm in the form of the House of Parliament. To my left, we have the church in the form of Westminster Abbey. Ahead of me, we have the judiciary in the form of the Supreme Court. And then over to my right, we have the executive arm in the form of Whitehall, which we've just walked down. Parliament Square is also surrounded by a number of different statues. We've got Gandhi, Nelson Mandela and a number of different Prime Ministers such as Winston Churchill who was Prime Minister during the Second World War and Lloyd George who was Prime Minister during the First World War. Going back in history it was Edward the Confessor, the penultimate Anglo-Saxon King who came to the area and decided to make London his capital. He built a palace and he also built a minster west of the original city of London, the Roman city of London, hence the name Westminster, which is now Westminster Abbey. The architecture of Edward the Confessor has long gone and been replaced by the buildings that are around us. Behind us, on the site of where the old palace was, we have the House of Parliament, which actually consists of two pieces of architecture. Firstly, we have original early English Gothic architecture of Westminster Hall, which was designed during the reign of William II. So it's original medieval. It's also where Guy Fawkes and Charles I were tried inside that. Surrounding Westminster Hall, we have Gothic revival architecture, which means it was built a lot later under the reign of Queen Victoria. What actually happened was in 1834, there was a fire that burnt down the House of Parliament and Westminster Palace. And the only bit to survive was Westminster Hall. A condition of the competition to redesign the House of Parliament was that it should be in the Gothic style of architecture and the winning entrant, Charles Barry, worked alongside the architect Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin to design the Gothic Revival masterpiece that we have behind us. It's actually Gothic Revival 
perpendicular architecture to match the eastern part of Westminster Abbey, which we'll talk about in a bit when we go over there. The Houses of Parliament include the Victoria Tower, which is 337 feet tall, and of course the iconic Clock Tower, now known as the Elizabeth Tower, with its famous bell, Big Ben, inside of it. Since the reign of Edward the Confessor, all of the monarchs, apart from two of them, Edward V and Edward VIII, have been coronated here at the Abbey. And there's also, below the floor of the Abbey, over 2,000 people buried there. From an architectural perspective, the current building consists of three distinct phases. The main body of the Abbey was constructed under the reign of Henry III in the 13th century, and it consists of original decorated Gothic architecture. The eastern part of the abbey, the Lady Chapel, was constructed during the reign of Henry VII and that is perpendicular style architecture, perpendicular style Gothic architecture, sometimes considered to be the one of the most beautiful buildings in the world, certainly at the time of construction. And then finally, the two towers on the front of the abbey are actually Gothic revival designed during the 1700s by the architect Nicholas Hawkes. So ladies and gentlemen, we've made it to the end of the tour on Westminster. And if you have enjoyed it, please do leave a like or better still subscribe and I'll see you on the next tour.